I live in a world of fire and sand. The crimson sun scorches the light from anything that crawls or flies. And storms of sand scowl the foliage from the barren ground. Lightning strikes from the cloudless sky, and peals of thunder roll unexplained across the vast tablelands. Even the wind, dry and searing as a kiln, can kill a man with thirst. This is a land of blood and dust, where tribes of feral elves sweep out of the salt plains to plunder lonely caravans. Mysterious singing winds call men to slow suffocation in a sea of silt, and legions of slaves clash over a few bushels of mouldering grain. The dragon despoils entire cities, while selfish kings squander their armies, raising gaudy palaces and garish tombs. This is my home, Arthas. It is an arid and bleak place. A wasteland with a handful of austere cities, clinging precariously to a few scattered oases. It is a brutal and savage land, beset by political strife and monstrous abominations, where life is grim and short. Greetings dear viewer, it is I. As you could probably tell from that introduction, this video is all about Dark Sun. The original box set was released in 1991 for the second edition of Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons. And 32 years on, it still looms large in the tabletop RPG consciousness, but why? Well, in this video, I will tell you. I'll go through what I think are the main secrets that helps Dark Sun stand out, and uh, I'll teach you how you can use them in your own world building. This won't be a kind of full lore breakdown video, more of a cheat sheet of how to make your own stuff just as good. So if you'd like to learn what makes Dark Sun one of the best settings ever, then sit down, buckle up, and fill your water skin right up to the brim. So let's dive straight in. Now the first big thing that Dark Sun does is take really all of your kind of traditional fantasy expectations and just dump them straight into a uh, giant infested silt estuary. If you're expecting, uh, you know, feudal knights running around on horseback with mail and plate armor, if you're expecting a uh, a panoply of, uh, of pagan deities and uh, you know various shrines and temples, or if you're expecting you know, beautiful, lush, verdant forests filled with uh, you know strange and exotic creatures, then uh... surprise, motherfucker! Instead, Dark Sun is a post-apocalyptic desert hellhole. There are no, you know, dukes and barons, or just, you know, corrupt sorcerer kings. There are no, you know, feudal knights and peasants. But there are slaves aplenty. And, uh, while you will find plenty of monsters, they are in stilt lakes, deserts, stony barrens. It's a, uh, got a, quite a bit of a different feel to it. And then you come to the, the gods. Or really the fact that there, there aren't any. Now, the sorcerer kings don't want you to think that. But when you take into account that, uh, most clerics will be worshipping A, uh, one of the four elements, B, a sorcerer king who can take their powers away at any time, or C, some, you know, natural object such as, you know, uh, an oasis, a massive lump of sand, a massive lump of rock, um, the wind in a canyon. It does have much more of an atheistic feel to it. Even further down the, the crazy train, we have the fantasy races. Dark Sun does have dwarves, elves, and halflings, even though it wasn't planning to. When it was originally pitched to TSR, the designers wanted it to be a human-only setting. But uh, the big wigs thought that would be a bit too much of a stretch, and so what the designers did instead was keep those races, but flip them on their heads. Dwarves are now bald. They live in villages, uh, on the surface, and they breed with humans to create moles, which uh, mostly are used as either labourers or more commonly as gladiators. Elves are clannish desert nomads who run everywhere, uh, they put even the best marathoners to shame, it would seem. And then there's the halflings. Now the good news is that the halflings are a little bit familiar. They do still love food. The big change here is that their favourite meal is now people. Now what this means is that uh, Dark Sun feels very different. There is an immediate sense of whiplash that you have as you're going through the box set. You know, you find all these things that you have to kind of adjust your expectations, and uh, that creates a lot of opportunities for, you know, 
for exploration and storytelling. And uh, perhaps if you're you know a bit bored of the traditional stuff, or if there's some you know style story that you want to tell that just doesn't fit, then Dark Sun really gives you the the opportunity of a lifetime. And even with all that though, it still does manage to keep a lot of the kind of more essential fantasy bits. There are still monsters, there are still dungeons, there are still random encounters. I'm sure my players will love to hear that bit of information. And uh, you know, you are still playing D&D. This is a D&D setting. There is advancing spellcasting, there are hit points, there are classes. There is all of that fun stuff. And so yeah, you do need that kind of mixture. If Dark Sun had been too alien, I don't think it would have done so well. But because it does have, you know, still a bit of familiarity, all of the kind of, you know, uh, wacky subversive stuff really, really works. So yes, if you want an exciting, unique fantasy setting, then start by subverting expectations. The second thing you need to do is build a, a strong sense of style for your setting. Dark Sun does this basically immediately with, you know, being a desert. All of the, the sand, the stone, the silt really does give it a different, uh, you know, literally different feel, different descriptions, and thus a, uh, a different way of interacting with it. But Arthas doesn't stop its brutality just with the landscape. The, uh, the society is just as bad. Starting at the top, we have the Sorcerer Kings. These are generally super powerful defilers, occasionally psionicists, who, uh, you know, rule their, their warring city-states from, uh, you know, decadent, opulent palaces. It's never stated explicitly, but uh, it is strongly implied that those Sorcerer Kings are very much to blame for how, uh, how bad things are in Arthur's right now, and yet for most people, they're kind of stuck under them, unless you uh, run away to a slave village or you live as a nomad in the desert. And coming down to the next level, we have their main agents, the Templars, and these are these are clerics who derive their power directly from those Sorcerer Kings, and you can have that power revoked at any time for displeasing them. Now, Templars are an actual class that you can play in 2nd edition AD&D, and they have some of the most interesting level abilities that I've ever seen. Things like, you can lock a guy up and execute him. You can just take money from the treasury with only the faintest excuse for a reason. You can, you know, command an army of undead if you want to, just... And uh, while it's certainly not the, the most morally sound class to play, it's pretty very interesting. And it goes a level deeper because um, your level in the Templar class is also your level in the Templar hierarchy. A level 5 Templar can overrule anything that a level 4 Templar does. Oh, you wanted to lock that guy up and blackmail his family um, to pay you in exchange for his release? Yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Or if it does, then you're not the one getting the money. And there are plenty of details like this that just give give Darkson that sense of malice and cruelty. And then we reach the bottom, and at the bottom we have, well, the slaves. Darkson is full of them. They are in the fields, the quarries, the, uh, uh, in the houses of the rich, serving as scribes and artists and entertainers. They're gladiators in the arenas. They perform almost every function in society. I must say, this is a very nuanced, very realistic depiction of slavery. Far from the caricature of people being worked to death, and while that does happen, it also shows that there are, there are multiple places in society that slaves can hold, and that their, their lifestyle changes wildly depending on where they are. There are also, notably, slave villages. Slaves who will escape and run off into the desert to try and live free. Uh, we even get a bit of detail on the society. They're generally very brutal, but with you know, rather a fine theatre. So uh, a nice little mix there, I should say. Slavery is evil. Uh, I'm very glad that in our own world, the British Empire went around abolishing slavery. Voluntarily, in their own empire, and not so voluntarily in everybody else's. Uh, that being said, Dark Sun is a fantasy world. It doesn't have a morality and it doesn't need to. If you want your setting to be evil, you need to make it evil. Just having mindless monsters running around harassing villagers isn't evil, it's just capricious. Having villainous NPCs going around, I don't know, misgendering people, taking kids to drag shows, whatever the internet is complaining about this week. That's not evil, that's just preachy and annoying. If you want a setting to be evil, you need some all-pervading force that you either have to be complicit in, or take extreme steps to avoid. And slavery is one such option. It does give Arthur that cruelty, that brutality that really does make it shine. Give it a strong sense of style, whatever that takes. But you can't really maintain a strong sense of style if there is anything at all distracting from it. So your next step to creating a unique and exciting fantasy setting is to strip out all of the fluff. All of it. Now, Unpopular opinion here, Dungeons & Dragons has, and indeed has always had, too many monsters. You have the classic fantasy monsters, the orcs, the goblins, the dragons, the vampires, the, uh, the minotaurs. 
Then you have some actually pretty cool original monsters that D&D has invented over the years. Your Beholders, Mind Flayers, Mimics, Giant the Schemes, Owlbears. And then you have the weird dumb bloat ones, like the Bulet, which is a land shark. Or the Hook Horror, which is an underground creature with hooks that's horrible. And that has three variant stat blocks of three different younger versions of a Hook Horror. For some bloody reason. And then there are the ones where I don't know what they are, and I doubt you know either. Let me know in the comments, do you know what a Cataplapus, or a Xfart, or a Frogamoth is? No checking the books, no checking the books. Just let me know what you think they are off the top of your head. If you really were to have all of these monsters in the same fantasy world, there would be no civilization, just a smoking ruin where it used to be. There are too many, and nothing could ever handle dealing with them. Dark Sun takes this world of monster bloat, and just says no. Almost every monster is stripped out. And that includes the classic monsters like orcs and goblins and, uh, and vampires. And that includes the weird bloat monsters. There are no Xvarts in Dark Sun. It also includes horses. And also includes coconuts, so no imitating horses either. What you get instead of a horse, and also instead of a cow, is a kunk. It is a honey producing, giant rideable insect. And things get weirder. You have the Erdu, which is the main kind of pastoral farming animal, instead of like, you know, sheep or something. And what that is, is an orange scaly emu. Now, uh, I was born in Australia. I did not expect to find emus in this fantasy setting, and uh, given the horrors my ancestors have had trying to fight a war against them, I had hoped to evade these um, bullet dodging, um, skinny necked fucks in my fantasy escapism. But mate, if you can't get out of it, then get into it. So that's how it is. In fact, overall, Dark Sun has very few species. It has very low biodiversity. If you're a zoologist trying to play Dark Sun, that might irritate your suspension of disbelief. That's fine. But for the rest of us, it gives the setting incredible focus. All the monsters that are there have a reason to exist, and they're you know, reasonably cool. You have, for instance, the Braxat, which is a... Uh, kind of reptilian, humanoidy thing that, uh, you know, sneaks through the desert trying to ambush prey. And then you also have things like the, uh, the Belgoi, which are kind of pack-hunting psionic monsters that will, uh, you know, use their powers to lure you into an ambush and then kill you. And that's pretty neat. And beyond that, since there are no, you know, orcs or goblins or other traditional kind of humanoid evil races, if you are, you know, a human or an elf or a halfling or even a three queen, most of your enemies will be humans, elves, halflings, and three cranes. It gives things a very different feel, and like I said, a lot more focus. But this narrative of focus doesn't just extend to the creatures living on Athos, it extends to the lands on which they live. Athos has exactly four regions. The Sea of Silt in the center, which is a nearly impassable void of dust with the occasional island and mudflat inside. There are the Tablelands, which is a mix of like deserts and like rocky badlands and outcrops where almost everybody lives. There are the rigging mountains to the north and south, which are, you know, mountains with the odd, you know, valley in there where the halflings live and a few, a few herding tribes as well. And then beyond them are the hinterlands, which are nearly unexplored and nearly uninhabited. And, you know, I was reading through the war book, you know, in preparation for this, and I thought, wait, is that it? Is that all there is in Arthas? And the answer is no, it's actually slightly less. The only real part of the Tablelands with significant detail is the Tyr region in the west. And uh, that region has more detail than the entire rest of the setting put together. On the one hand, there's not much room to explore. On the other hand, everything in the Tyr region, every city, every village, every ruin, every oasis where you can drink water, is tightly intermeshed with everything else, creating a very you know, a very realistic, you know, interconnected kind of world, which I, I really do like. The thing that I've been trying to hammer home here is the importance of focus, narrowness, and cohesion. There are very few times when reading Dark Sun that you'll find something and go, why is this here? Or what am I supposed to do with this? Most of the time, you'll know what to do and you'll know how to use it. Both the rules book and the war book in the box set are each just shy of 100 pages and they're fairly easy to get through, even though they don't have indexes. So yeah, if you want a tight, focused fantasy setting, then strip out all the fluff. But if you're going to sacrifice breadth, then you need to make up for it with depth. And the best way to do that is to use touchstones, you know, key elements of the setting around which everything revolves. 
and Dark Sun does that pretty well. Let's start out with scarcity. There are two things that are very scarce on Arthas, water and metal. Let's start out with water. What little water there is on Arthas tends to come from a small collection of wells, springs, and oases dotted throughout the lands. In most cases, you'll need about a gallon a day, half that if you're only going out at night, and double that if you're in metal armor. You can also use proficiency rolls to try and find water in the wilderness. But if you keep filling those rolls, then you'll need to rely on whatever water you brought with you from town. And if that's not enough, then you'll start taking dehydration. The way that works, if you get at least half, not all of the water you need, then you lose 1d4 points of constitution per day. If you get less than half the water you need, you lose 1d6 points per day. And uh, you keep losing constitution until either you rehydrate or you die, whichever comes first. But wait, there's more. As soon as things get desperate, say a companion or two collapses from dehydration, you have to start making daily saving throws or gain chaotic evil alignment. That might sound a bit irrelevant, but hard alignment based rules were pretty common in early D&D, as controversial as they are nowadays. What this means is that each alignment has their own water sharing strategy. Lawful alignments tend to use you know, rules and systems to fairly distribute the water. Uh, good alignment characters tend to make sure that you know the weak are always cared for. Chaotic evil characters will steal, hoard, and do just about anything to make sure they get plenty of drink. Now this can constrain roleplay. And it can also provoke PvP, which some people don't like. But what it does do is absolutely hammer home just how scarce water is, and just how desperate not getting enough of it can make you feel. And in that sense, it really does, you know, keep that touchstone strong. The other scarce item on Arthas is metal. Now there is some, for instance, the city-state of Tyr has one of the only iron mines. Although given that its sorcerer king has gone mad, more on that later, the mines have been closed for literally years now. This means a couple of things. One, a lot of weapons are made from various alternative materials. There are rules in the book for things like wood, bone, and even obsidian weapons, which usually take some penalty to hit, some penalty to damage, and may have a percentage chance of breaking on a hit. Obviously, these aren't as good as proper steel, but you might not be able to get steel, and so you just gotta make do. There's another place where metal scarcity comes up, and that's actually with currency. Now, silver and gold coins are minted and are in circulation, but they're worth a lot more, as are any metal items that you might find. The way this works rules-wise is that metal items actually have their normal book price. They're worth more, the coins are worth more, it cancels out. Non-metal items are actually worth 1% the book price. And to make this a bit easier, Copper coins are replaced with ceramic coins that are broken up into 10 bits, so the cheap stuff, you can still figure out how to finance those. It should also be noted that Ducks and Rolls actually also encourage you to give out less loot. So, coins may go further, but you won't have as many. All this comes together to just remind you how valuable metal is, every single time you go to buy something or sell something. Now let's move on to magic. There are two types of arcane magic in Dark Sun, and those are preservers and defilers. Defilers destroy the beauty of nature every time they cast a spell, and preservers have to bend themselves over backwards just to prevent that from happening. Uh, the way this works mechanically is that uh, there is a there is a yard radius of plant of destruction that defilers inflict every time they cast a spell. Uh, there's also an initiative penalty that they inflict on anyone near them, and uh, preservers just have a slower XP advancement table. There's also a very important kind of societal level to this. Every group on Arthas has its attitudes to both types of mage. And interestingly, defilers are slightly more popular. Both raiding tribes and the city-states will gladly take in defilers, while preservers are often forced into a kind of secretive group called the Veiled Alliance. Now bear in mind, they're still unpopular. They do get kicked out of a lot of places just because of the destruction that they cause. But they are tolerated because a lot of people in Arthas just value power more than morality. As for divine magic, there are no gods in Dark Sun, but there are still clerics. Uh, most of those clerics will be worshipping one of the four elemental planes. Uh, if you would rather pray to some named sentient entity though, the Templars got you covered. They get their power directly from the Sorcerer Kings, who can also take their power away if they want. But if you don't want to worship something that's pretty much explicitly evil, they tend to be hermits who live on a particular terrain feature from which they derive their magical power. And all of this comes together to kind of explore man's relationship both to nature and to God in the gloomiest way possible. Uh, defilers, 
you know, use nature for profit, converting it into magical power effectively. Meanwhile, preservers and druids fight valiantly, and often in vain, to keep what little life there is on Athos still breathing. On the other hand, you have clerics, who are calling out to basically whatever power will answer. Templars, who answer to an evil entity more man than God. And so beyond being atheistic, Dark Sun goes straight up into Nietzschean nihilism. It's pretty dark and pretty brutal. The last thing I want to touch on, though, is psionics. Pretty much every creature on Arthas has psionic potential. I'm not going to comment too much on the rules for this, because I don't own the 2e psionics handbook, and even if I did, I don't know the edition well enough that I would be able to understand or comment on it. But I can talk about how psionics is used in the setting, and it's used pretty much everywhere, and quite intelligently at that. You see monsters like the Belgoi using psionics to lure their prey into ambushes. You see psionic slaves using their powers to break free of their masters, and those masters using psionics right back to control their slaves. It's all very well interconnected, and so I was almost fooled, almost, into thinking that TSR included this for reasons other than selling more psionics handbooks. So when you put all this together, the scarcity, the, uh, the relationship to nature and God, the making TSR more money thing, all of it comes together to give a very detailed, very cohesive sense of identity to Dark Sun. And so yeah, if you want something similar in your own setting, then that's what you have to do. You focus on the touchstones. All the tips that I've just given you will help you create a generically good fantasy setting. But specifically, a tabletop RPG setting has one very important requirement. And that's adventurability, which is what I'm calling the potential of a setting to, one, have opportunities for adventure, and two, for those opportunities to be interesting. And Dark Sun accomplishes this in a number of ways. First off, the box set actually comes with an adventure. It's in what they call a flipbook format. You have, in the print version, two spiral-bound books. Uh, one is for the GM and details each of the encounters that the players will come across. And the other one is for the players and it has visual aids for those encounters. I have not played the adventure myself and I don't want to spoil it. But suffice to say that the key themes here are escaped slaves, trying to get water, everything that can kill you, trying to kill you, and elves being literally the worst. The next technique that Dark Sun uses is to outline a whole bunch of potential adventure sites in the lore book. I'm being very clear with my language here, potential adventure site. You see, in early D&D, rather than the visit X, kill Y, or fetch Z questlines that uh, you tend to see in more modern games, early D&D just said, hey, here's a place, here's some potential dangers, some potential treasures, and uh, we assume that you want to visit here because it has plunder and monsters that give you XP when you kill them. And the Dark Sun War Book does that to a T. It gives you everything from the ruined city of Yaramuke to a toll operated well where, you know, you can go there, smash the door in, kill the people operated, and take all their toll money. That is an adventure you can have. And like I said, it's all very vague. You usually get only about a paragraph of text. But that's probably enough for a sufficiently creative GM to, you know, go in and fill the details. The final way is the kind of big, full of tier meta plot. Uh, King Kalak, the self-styled Tyrant of Tear, has been getting a bit senile in his supernaturally old age, and for the last 20 years he's been trying to build a giant ziggurat in the centre of the city that he claims will protect it from the dragon. Yes, Dark Sun only has one dragon, but don't worry, it's scary enough to burn the world all by itself. This would be fine if Karlak wasn't using every single slave in the city to build it. And what this means is that there is nobody down in the iron mines, uh, there is no iron being exported, and the economy is crashing. Nobles and merchants are selling off what few possessions they have to get food. Slaves without possessions are starving to death, and the neighbouring city-states are threatening war if the mines aren't reopened. And the big deal here is that almost all of what I just said is in the present tense. And what that means is that the story is very much unfinished and very much open-ended. And if you want, you know, some epic fantasy story within your setting in a tabletop RPG, that is how you do it. You create the setup, you create the inciting incident, and everything else you leave up to play. Every good fantasy setting has its big climactic conflicts. But if that conflict happens a thousand years ago, it doesn't really affect the current story, none of your players will read that section of the law. They won't. Trust me. So it really has to be something that is right there, right now, and that, importantly, that they can take part in. It also needs to be, you know, not a foregone conclusion. You know, any number of things could happen in this metaphor, depending on how your campaign goes. You know, we do have some details, say, the city of Uruk, 
and the fact that they have destroyed city-states before. We know this with the, the ruins of Yadamuke. But what we don't know is whether they can win against Tyr. We don't know what they'll do if they lose. We don't know if the population will rise up and kill Kadak first. Any number of things can happen. And that's what makes it cool. It's all about the opportunities, the adventurability to go in and say, okay, we'll take some actions, we'll make some roles, and we'll see how things play out. So always remember, you're making an RPG setting, you'll be playing adventures in it, so make damn sure it's adventurable. Now, for all the glowing praise that I've given Dark Sun, it's most certainly not perfect. And you know what? If you're going to learn from its double use, then you should learn from its L's too. Let's start with brutality. Fantasy settings can be brutal. And some of the time, fantasy settings should be brutal. But you can't be all brutal all the time. Now, I know, I know. I can hear every single player that I have ever had sat at my table screaming out that after all that I've put them through... How dare you! Tell other people not to crush their players with all their weight. But you see, Dark Side actually goes in places a bit too brutal. It forgets the, the very important counterpoint to brutality, and that's hope and rest. If you want to be able to continuously lay on the pain, then you have to let them rest, you have to let them recover, and you have to let their trauma resistance reset back to zero. And Dark Sun's flavor text does talk about the importance of hope, of kindness, of light amid the darkness. But every time that the actual nuts and bolts of it gets the chance to show mercy, it balks. Now let's take, say, Desert Oases. These are a perfect opportunity to show how, even in a land as deadly and inhospitable as Arthas, there are always a few safe places here and there. But no, instead, each of the oases described in the lore book, while unique and interesting, has some detail about it that makes it so unpleasant that you'd almost rather die of thirst than visit. And then there's something like the Veiled Alliance. Now, that could actually be a really interesting organization that could, you know, help out and be affiliated with a good aligned party. I mean, their whole shtick is protecting what little life there is from being destroyed by defilers. But in practice, they're described as so secretive that they might at best only put in the bare minimum to help the party, and at worst do absolutely nothing in order to avoid being exposed. And I get it, I get it, there are very good in-world reasons for everyone to be cruel and brutal all the time. If you're in an inhospitable land with not enough to go around, why would you be charitable? But the thing is, if you want a brutal fantasy setting, you do need to answer this question, even if Dark Sun doesn't want to. The other issue is an oddly specific nitpick, about an oddly specific conclusion, but trust me, it matters. Uh, remember how I mentioned that um, TSR definitely didn't put psionics on absolutely everything in Dark Sun in order to sell more psionics handbooks? Well, they definitely also didn't include a battle system, AD&D 2E's mass combat rules, in Dark Sun in order to sell more copies of battle system. They definitely didn't do that. The thing is, unlike with psionics, just kind of fairly well tied into the setting, Battle system doesn't quite fit as well. They have made a few changes to the rules to facilitate it. Uh, fighters and gladiators at 10th level and uh, every level thereafter gain military units as followers. And other classes can acquire various followers. In fact, Templars can raise undead in their Sorcerer King's name. But there's not really much of a clear reason why. You know, sure, there's warfare. City-states war with each other all the time. Raiding tribes will attack isolated villages. And elves will do what elves will do. But there's no real indication of what the PCs would do with an army, and why they would want to raise it. And especially for gladiators, these guys trained for one-on-one -on -one combat. Why are they leading armies? Just because Spartacus did it once, doesn't mean every gladiator PC will want to do it in their campaign. It just doesn't, it just feels a bit shoehorned in, to be honest, and that's... You know how I mentioned earlier the rule of stripping up all the fluff? Well, very clearly, the designers didn't do that here, and as far as I'm concerned, they paid for it. So yeah, bad designers. Bad. And those are my two complaints. So, let's tie this video in a lovely little bow. The big thing that's given Dark Sun its fame and its popularity has been that very unique feel. You know, not that, you know, traditional fantasy settings can't feel unique, but when you chuck everybody into the deserts of Arthas, that uniqueness comes a lot easier and it's probably the biggest reason that people still talk about it 30 years after it was made. But beneath all that style, there is in fact substance. With only a few exceptions, almost everything that Dark Sun does 
is oriented around its core themes, which means that it's able to hold interest beyond just a surface reading of the books. And finally, to anyone watching this video to get inspiration from Dark Sun, a quick word of warning. There have been plenty of desert fantasy settings and plenty of settings with the word sun in the name that have been released in the last 30 years, and none of them have done as well as Dark Sun. And there's a reason. What they did is they copied the surface level elements of the setting and hope that'll be enough, and it just never is. If you take anything from Dark Sun, and indeed anything from this video, it should be those well-designed principles that make Arthas feel the way it does, because those can be used anywhere, whether it be in optimistic high fantasy, in gothic steampunk, or gritty sci-fi, those rules will still hold and they will still give you success. Remember, bad artists copy, and good artists steal. And it's a wrap, thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, a share, and a comment. And if you'd like to see more, then please hit the subscribe button and hit the bell for notifications. The Cyberpunk video has been on hold, but I'll be getting back to it very soon. And the, uh, the next video should be out mid to late June, although I haven't quite decided what it will be. So until I see you next, farewell.